I'm going to go into some of the details to give you guys more in-depth knowledge about some of the things. And I'll talk to you guys about exactly what the Black Holocaust Museum is. This is the founder of our museum, Dr. James Cameron. He founded the museum back in 1988. Uh, back in 1930, he survived the lynching in Marion, Indiana. It's probably one of the most famous lynching photographs, if not the most famous. I'll show it to you guys a little He's later. Black. He doesn't look black. Um, He's black. Dr. Cameron uh, survived the lynching, which I'll tell you in more detail about later. He started several branches of the NAACP in Indiana, and he founded the museum uh, in 1988. He passed away at the age of 92, uh, and you know he's been greatly missed ever since he passed away. He uh, became a, a mentor for me as I became a volunteer at the museum, and I grew uh, very close to him and his family. He got to know his wife, uh, his children very well, and still very good friends with the family uh, to this day. One of the things that I've always believed is that this proverb is really a singular uh, example of why we need these types of discussions. Uh, this African proverb tells that until lions tell their tale, the story of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. That's the way it's been forever. That's just the way life is. The people who win always get to tell the story. The victors always get to tell the stories. And so sometimes you have to go back and then look and then get the other side of the story. You get the side of the people who really don't get to voice their opinions about what happened. So that's part of what I plan to do tonight is to tell you guys some of those stories that have been left out of our history classrooms, that have been kept out of our history our textbooks. I'm a teacher, and so I, I know it's being kept out. <laughs> and, and I'll talk about some of those things that I think should be in those books. So this is what I plan to do with you guys. I want to challenge what you learned in history class, clarify some of those questions you pondered about race relations, make you see American history differently, and give you an idea of how we've gotten to where we are in terms of race relations in this country, because it's a fascinating story uh, in terms of how we've gotten to where we are. And we don't like to have discussions about it. We don't talk about it enough. So I do want to warn you ahead of time that many of the images you're going to see are very graphic in nature. I'm going to show you guys some images of some lynching victims. Uh, and they're very, very difficult images to look at, but they are real images. They were often put on postcards. People would sign their name on the back, stick a stamp on it, put them in the mail, just like they would a postcard from the Statue of Liberty. So these are images that came uh, from primarily postcards and images that, that other people kept. They were very rarely in newspapers, but sometimes they were. So I want you guys to look at this quote, and then we'll come back to it a little later. But read this quote and then we'll come back and I'll ask you if you know who said this. Yes, please. Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln. Very good. We'll talk about these specific words that he said and kind he of talk that. about his philosophy. So we'll get back to Abraham Lincoln a little later. Very good. All right. So I'm going to start with uh, the transatlantic slave trade. Um, and this is the story of the largest forced migration in human history. And quite often you would see posters like this announcing that a ship has arrived with a cargo of African men, women, and children, and they're going to be sold at a specific place at a specific time. These are very common. Uh, and they would oftentimes describe the cargo. They would describe the skill sets that the people had. They would describe where they came from in Africa. Lots of different things to entice you to come down and purchase people on that particular day. Okay, so this is, this is how it worked. This is what's called the transatlantic tra slave trade, beginning in the early 1500s, lasting almost through uh, the late 1880s when Brazil outlawed slavery and ended 
the traffic in people. 12 to 15 million African men, women, and children were transported to different parts of the Americas from the early 1500s to the late 1880s. And contrary to popular belief, only a very small percentage came to the United States. Out of all of those 15, 12 to 15 million people, only about 3 to 5 percent came to the U.S. Uh, about 40 percent went to Brazil, which was the largest uh, destination, but they also went to places throughout the Caribbean, uh, Central and South America. When you go to Jamaica and you see blacks, they came over on the same ships my ancestors came on. Uh, when you go to the Bahamas, when you go to the Dominican Republic, all of those places and you see blacks, that's because their ancestors came over the same way. In fact, Brazil to this day has the largest African ancestor population outside of Africa of any nation on the planet Earth. If you took the Afro-Brazilians out of Brazil, transported them back to Africa, they become the second largest nation in Africa. So you can see the impact that it had on Brazil. What color are the Brazilians? Brazilians are a multitude of different colors, a multitude of different colors. One of the things that's kind of different about Brazil versus the United States in terms of um, the colors that people have, they did not have a problem with intermarriage in Brazil. The Portuguese really didn't frown on it, so people married, it, it didn't really make a difference. They didn't see any reason that you shouldn't be able to marry whomever you married, whereas there were restrictions in the United States. But Brazil, so you have a rainbow of people in Brazil, even to this day. Yes, sir? When uh, blacks from Africa married in Brazil, were they able to do that even as slaves? Well, well, the laws change over, over, over the course of time. Early on, uh, typically marriage was, was okay. It wasn't frowned upon at all. It didn't really make a difference. They didn't really think that it was all that big of a deal because they were typically going to work the people for a very short period of time and they were going to die off pretty quickly. Brazil was one of the more difficult places to be enslaved at because of the, the type of work that they had them doing. They led very short lives in Brazil. They typically lasted anywhere from three to five years and they were dead. So this whole idea of even being married really didn't make that big of a difference. But then as people started to have children and then those generations started to grow more from, from the indigenous population in Brazil instead of all these people being transported from Africa, then it changed a little bit. But initially it wasn't a big deal. Later on it changed uh, as you got a larger black population. So this is kind of the journey of the transatlantic slave trade. So what happens is you have different ships that will be loaded with goods and commodities in different European ports in Spain, Portugal, France, England, pretty much every nation in Europe took place, took a part in this. And these ships were designed specifically to carry different types of cargo. Their main cargo would be African men, women, and children. These ships would be outfitted to continue a journey from Europe to Africa to the New World and then back to Europe. And there were different commodities that they took along the way. These ships were ships that anybody who had the money could invest in the journeys. So if you were a wealthy person, you were a king or queen, you were some wealthy person, you could invest money in that journey and then whatever the profit margin was, you'd get that profit at the end. Sometimes you made lots of money, sometimes you made no money, the ships may have run into a storm, whatever, different things happen, but for the most part it was a pretty profitable business to invest in. And just as we trade in stocks today, they did the same thing with these ships back in the day. And then different European governments actually set up their own companies. The Royal African Company was set up by the British government to make sure that all of these ships that they kept detailed records. And we'll talk about the records that they kept and what happened. So the ships would leave loaded with goods and commodities, and then they travel down to the coast of West Africa. And this really begins in the, in the 1500s where they began to transport people across the Atlantic Ocean. Prior to that, they would go down to West Africa and they would transport the people back to different places in Europe. So they would be sold or given to very wealthy people. The first uh, case of Africans being taken out of, of Africa by Europeans is in 1441, a place called Cape Bojador, which is off the western coast of Africa. A Portuguese ship landed there and they took a group of about 10 Africans and transported them back gave them the Prince Henry the Navigator, who was the leader of Portugal at the time, and he was so excited, he gave a few of these Africans, some of his wealthy friends, and said, you know, go back and get a few more. And so they began to transport Africans back into places in Europe, basically as, as house servants for very wealthy people. So it was kind of like having a, an exotic 
uh, house servant instead of the average house servant that you have. Instead of having some poor European, you now have some poor African as your house servant. And so that was the reason they were transported. But then in Columbus, made his journey in 1492, and he began to enslave the native people of the New World. Those people fought back, and they literally died from diseases that they had never been exposed to. So in a short period of time, they realized that this labor force that they had getting the gold and silver out of the ground needed to be replaced. So they picked Africans as a replacement labor force. So really in the early 1500s, they began to transport Africans over to replace the Native Americans who were dying off in large numbers. So what happens once the ship arrives in Africa? Several things are gonna occur before the ship arrives. Slavery as an institution is very old. It's been around since biblical times. Lots of stories in the Bible about slaves. It's an institution that you've seen all over the planet Earth. But slavery changed as a result of this business. What typically happens, even in Africa, the slavery that exists in Africa, there were three ways you became a <coughs> slave person. One, if you committed a crime, you have to pay that debt back to your community. If you were a debtor, you have to pay that debt back to the person that you owed it to. Or if you were captured as a prisoner of war, you had to pay that debt back. So you would be put in this condition of servitude, which really wasn't a condition where someone owned you, could whip you, treat you badly. They typically treated you pretty well. They wanted you to, to act you know, as if you were a person who wanted to be a part of the community. Because if you didn't, if they mistreated you, you typically acted badly and they had problems with you, they didn't want to have those problems. And typically the only person who'd be allowed to really sell these people or mistreat them would be the leaders of that community. So kings and queens would be the only people who could really mistreat these people. So for the most part, if you were enslaved in Africa, it was bad, of course, because you were enslaved, you were away from whomever your family was, but it wasn't the worst thing in the world. And that's typically the way that slavery was in most places, for the most part. You weren't somebody's personal property at this time. That form of slavery actually developed as a result of the transatlantic slave trade. You developed this form of slavery that's known as chattel slavery, where you actually become someone's personal property, just like a horse they own, just like a barn they own, just like a piece of land. So all of this develops because of the huge profits that come out of this. So we go to Africa, and for about 50, 60 years or so, Europeans have built trading posts along the coast of West Africa to do business with African people. They bring different commodities from Europe. They trade them uh, for different African commodities. So this business continues for 50, 60 years. And then once they realize that they need this labor force to replace the Indians, they began to go into Africa instead of buying the things that they were buying previously, like spices, um, they began to buy people instead. So they would go to these leaders who had <coughs> slaves and they'd say, we want to offer you these goods and commodities for X number of slaves that you have. And so, you know, it really wasn't a big deal. These kings and queens were very much like kings and queens everywhere. They were rich. They didn't really care about these people because they were the lowest of the low in their community. They would sell them without any problems. But eventually, that doesn't work very well because now you bought 15, 20, that's all they had. Well, you need more than that because this journey that you're taking, the people who funded this journey require you to get 150 people. So now you have to begin to go further into the interior of Africa and you begin to raid towns and villages and you begin <coughs> to kidnap people. Or you go in and you make deals with the leaders. You bring in two weapons with you that the Africans didn't have. One were guns. You bring old, raggedy, rusty guns with you, but old, raggedy, rusty guns are better than no guns at all. And so you make a deal with these people. You say, I'll give you these guns to go across the river to attack your neighbor so that you can bring some of those people back and sell those people to you. They also brought very strong distilled beverages, their second weapon, very strong distilled beverages, got these people liquored up, made better deals with them, and eventually what happens in Western Africa, you become one of, one of two things. You either become a slave raider or you become a slave. So those are the only choices you have left. Uh, obviously, people fought back. They didn't just accept this idea of people coming and taking people, but they didn't have the weapons to fight back and begin to divide and conquer these people. It becomes one of these things where it's, it's almost impossible to stop because it becomes so widespread. And as a result, millions and millions of Africans will be taken away from the continent of Africa against their will. So. 
you make your first stop, say you pick up 15, 20, 30 people. Well, that's not enough. You then make several other stops. You go further down the coast of West Africa. You make several stops along the way. You pick up 10 people here, five people here, 30 people there, until you have a full load. That ship will not leave Africa unless it has a full load of people that it's supposed to have when it leaves. If that ship is supposed to take 150 people, they're not going to leave with 140 now. They're going to leave with exactly 150, or they may take on a few extras, but they're never going to leave with less than they're supposed to because if they do, the people that own the ship back in Europe are going to be very upset because this is a commodity that they're going to make several dollars off of and they want to make sure that they know the exact amount of money that they should make off of the journey before they invest in it. So now you go, you load up the ships. What happens is these trading posts that you've built along the coast of West Africa, many of them are still in existence. You have El Elmina Castle in Ghana, Cape Coast Castle, two of the bigger ones ever built. These huge fortified entrenchments where they had a big dungeon that they kept the African men, women, and children in. They had big cannons in front to make sure that people didn't attack because different European nations fought over these, these, these things. They wanted to control the, the flow of Africans from that particular point. So if they control that particular fortress, they control the trade in that area. So they would fight wars over these fortresses and whoever owned it at any particular <coughs> time would make sure it was fortified with these huge cannons in case someone tried to attack it. So this, many of those, like I said, are still there in existence in West Africa as we speak. So now you have these people. You take these people, you put them in a dungeon after you've taken them from maybe 50 miles away, 100 miles away, sometimes as far away as 1,000 miles away, these people are transported in what are known as slave coffers. What happens is they capture the people, they shackle them to one another, and they force them to walk to wherever that fortress is and they're going to be held in the dungeon of that. So on the way there, they're going through very treacherous areas. They go over uh, rivers. They go through jungle areas. I mean, they go through some very treacherous areas sometimes. And some of the people don't survive. Some of the people may fall over a cliff and die. Some people may drown. Someone may be attacked by an animal. Some, somebody may just be very sick when they begin a journey and die. So a lot of people are going to die on the way there. In, 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 in excess of the people that died in the wars that the Africans are going to fight against each other. Because if we think about it, if you go into this village as a small group of Europeans, you're going to have less of a chance of capturing people unless you have some African compatriots. So you're going to have these Africans who are going to work with you, and it becomes a business. Businessmen do what they have to do to make money. And so you begin to get these Africans who are known in history as factors, who will actually help you to capture these people, because they're going to be paid very handsomely for it. What were they uh, called? They're called factors. Oh. Factors. Many of these fortresses that they built, they refer to these fortresses as factories. So these people that worked in the factories were known as factors. So what happens is you get this group of people that go in and sometimes you force the Africans to fight wars and so lots of people are going to die along the way before they even get to the dungeons. Once they get to the dungeons, they're going to be shackled and they're going to wait until a ship arrives and someone from any particular ship who wants to purchase those people will come in and buy them. So let's just say there's a husband, wife, two children, they're held in this dungeon together. A ship arrives, they may just want the husband, so they'll buy the husband. Someone else wants to buy the two children, they'll buy the two children. Someone else wants to buy the wife. So the family's going to be separated there as well. And once the ship has its load, they decide how many people they're going to purchase. They put them in small canoes and they roll out to the ship that's waiting in the harbor. This is the time when Africans take advantage and try to mutiny or escape most often. Because they can still see home. They may be 50 miles away, 100 miles away, 200 miles away, but they can still see land. They know that there's water out there. They don't know where the people are taking them, but they know that if they're going to try to escape, now is the best time. We're still right here next to land. We can escape and get away. And so what happens is there are oftentimes mutinies as the ships sit and wait. And the ship's captains learn very early on that if we want to prevent these mutinies from happening, we have to put some, some security procedures in place. We have certain protocols we put in place to make sure these things don't happen. So they make sure that the men are separated from the women and children. The women and children are kind of allowed to roam around the ship freely. They're not a security risk, whereas the men are a very huge security risk. So they keep the men locked in the bottom of the ship, typically in very hot compartments, and they have guards posted 24 hours a day, making sure that the men can escape. So now, these people have purchased them. They're going to brand the people right away. 
the owners of the ship will have their own brand and they're going to brand the people typically on their arm or on their chest so now you know who they belong to. Then the ship will disembark. Does someone ask a How question? How do you brand? Hmm? How do you brand? A hot iron just like they brand horses and cattle. Hot and I'll, I'll show you guys an image of one of them uh, a little while later. So they would brand them and then the ship would disembark on its way across the Atlantic Ocean and what's known as the Middle Passage. Now the reason it's called the Middle Passage these ships take this journey from Europe down to Africa. That's the first leg of the journey. And the cargo on that leg of the journey are all of these goods and commodities they're going to buy African men, women, and children with. The second leg of the journey, the cargo would be African men, women, and children. So they disembark somewhere in, in the New World, whether it be Brazil, Jamaica, Barbados, Miami, uh, Charleston, South Carolina, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, New York City, um, Mobile, Alabama, all of these different places where they sell these African people at. They then load those ships up with goods and commodities because they will sell those people for goods and commodities like rice, sugar cane, sugar, tobacco, all of these different things. And then they, they will take those goods and commodities back to Europe. One of the biggest commodities, probably the most important, when the British became involved, and the British were really the, 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 the big entity involved in this for about 100 years or so, was sugar. And the reason sugar was so important was because people in, in England drank a lot of tea. And they wanted to have sweetened tea. They wanted some sugar in their tea. And so they got the sugar from either Brazil, somewhere in the Caribbean, or somewhere in the southern part of the United States. So really a lot of this transportation of Africans back and forth was because the British needed some sugar. And they were going to get their sugar whatever way they needed to get it. And so these ships would then arrive back in Europe, and then they'd count up how much they made. And so it was either a profitable journey or a non-profitable journey. In most cases, it would be profitable if the journey was successful and most of the Africans arrived safely. So we're going to talk about that journey and what happens on the ships. Anyone have any questions thus far? OK, let's move on. OK, so now we're going to talk about what's called the Middle Passage. The Middle Passage, as I showed you guys, is a journey across the Atlantic Ocean, whether that journey began in, in, in wherever it began in, in Western Africa or in some places, Southern Africa, some places in Eastern Africa. The Brazilian people, if you look at it geographically, Brazil is pretty close to Africa. So the Brazilians and the Portuguese who ran Brazil for many years, they concentrated their efforts mostly on Southern Africa in places like Angola. That's where most of the people they transported came from. Whereas the Western nations of Europe, like the French, the British, the Dutch, they concentrated their efforts further up the coast of West Africa. So the journey begins, and it's called the Middle Passage. And if we look, this is an image of a ship. And as we look at this ship, you can see very clearly that the people are lined up in very specific ways. This is how the ships were designed. They were designed to hold a very specific number of people. And the people who designed the ships knew that the ships were designed to carry specific cargoes. I always say this. We call these ships slave ships. I never call them that. I never call them slave ships. I call them cargo ships because the first leg of the journey from Europe to Africa, no Africans are on board the ship. The second leg of the journey, the cargo would be what they call black cargo, or African men, women, and children. The third leg of the journey, no Africans are on board the ship. So two thirds of the journey that these ships take, no Africans are on board. So why do we call them slave ships? They're really only slave in ships during the course of a journey called the Middle Passage, okay? So we'll talk about what happens on board these ships. I talked to you guys earlier about brand. This will be an example of a brand that they would have, that they would brand the people with. Sometimes they would be branded in those fortresses in West Africa, South Africa, wherever. Sometimes they would be sold again once they arrived in the New World and be branded again. And so oftentimes, you know, we, we typically think that they're captured in Africa, they're taken to the ships, they're brought to the New World, and then that, that's the end of it. But these people would be sold numerous times in the course of their lives. It's a business. This is a business of owning property. It's not people. They're not looked on as people. They're looked on as chattel or property. And you could use the property that you own to do a variety of different things, which we'll detail shortly. But you can see this image here, and I'm going to blow that up. 
so you can see it a little bit better. This will be typically the conditions down in the hold of the ship where the men were. Now the men were kept shackled to one another and they were also shackled to these wooden posts so that they could not escape. They had very small amounts of room depending on how the ship was packed. They had two different methods of packing the ships. One method, which is this, is called loose packing. Okay? Now this ship would say hold 150 people, but if you tight packed it, you can get 225, 250 people on the men. And the way that they did that, they, they used what was called a spoon position. You guys ever seen sardines in a can before? Mm -hmm. They did the same thing with these, with these men. They would have one man with his head facing that way, and then they'd bring another man in, and they'd put him, and they'd have them clamped together just like this in what they call a spoon position. And oftentimes when they did bring in the small amounts of food and water that they gave them, they would fight over the food because they didn't get a lot of food. And so these men would be struggling to survive. And if you're, if you're at that point of starvation, you're going to fight over the food. They didn't have bathrooms on these ships. So during the course of this journey, wherever you were, that was typically your bathroom. And even though they're showing these men here with clothing on, in many cases they didn't have any clothing on. Nothing. Nothing whatsoever because it, it, it wasn't necessary as far as the crew members were concerned. And so you're down in the hold of the ship where the men were. It's typically extremely hot, well over 100 degrees. You cross the Atlantic Ocean near the equator. It's over 100 degrees easily down in the hold of the ship. Some of the ships they would put portholes in to let air flow. Some would actually have grates on above this compartment. Say at the top of that, you'd have a grate to allow air to flow. Now that ended up being a mistake that the shipbuilders made. What happens is the women and children are allowed to roam around the ship up on the top of the deck. The men are only brought up maybe once or twice a week to be exercised. They don't want them to grow stiff, so they want to exercise and they'll force them to dance and things of that nature. But the women and children can walk around freely for the most part all day long. So what happens is there's two reasons. Number one, they're not a security risk. They're not afraid of these women and children. They can over, you know, overpower them very easily. But secondly, there are never any European women on board these ships. Never. Not a, I've never read a single account of a European woman being on one of these ships. It's all European men. Obviously we know it's going to take place. These females are going to be raped repeatedly, whether they be women or young girls, repeatedly raped during the course of these, these, these ships crossing the Atlantic Ocean. Even if we go back to the fortresses where they held, waiting for the ships to arrive, it may be six months before a ship arrives. So while the women are there, the people that run this place, there's no European women in those fortresses either, so they take advantage of women. But one of the things that's interesting about it, though, is that they oftentimes marry these African women. The people that ran these fortresses, people I told you, told you guys were called factors, would often marry these African women. And if you go to Africa today, in, 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 in a variety of different places, you'll find small communities outside of where these fortresses were, where every African person, practically, has a European sounding last name. Because they married the women and they said, well, you know, when the ship comes, I'm not selling my wife and children. And so they would actually have these interracial families quite often. Lots of small places in Africa still have that to was this day. Was that a moral day. issue that they married them? What's that? Was that for moral reasons that they well, married them? Well, I think what happened is, is even though they were being treated as less than humans, they were humans. They fell in love just like they would fall in love with anyone else. They were lonely. Obviously, they wanted companionship. They met these women. They fell in love with the woman, perhaps. Maybe she fell in love with them. Sometimes maybe it was forced. But eventually, I mean, one thing that, that we, we can't do is to dehumanize people forever. We've always found ways to dehumanize people, to justify treating them badly, but eventually you get around to noticing that they, they're just like you are. So you can only dehumanize people and treat them badly for so long before, from, from, from a sense of, of whether it be uh, your morals or whatever, something gets to you and you realize that this is a human being that I'm not treating like a human being. And so they would oftentimes fall in love with these women and marry these women. So during the course of this journey, many blacks would come on board the ship and jump overboard to commit suicide. They believed, many of their religious beliefs told them that if you committed suicide, you would be reincarnated back home with your families. And so they would begin to jump overboard or the women would toss their children overboard. Many babies were born in those fortresses along the coast of West Africa. Several babies would be born on board the ship if a woman was still pregnant. So during the course of the journey, the woman did not want her child to end up living under these conditions, so they would throw the babies overboard. They would jump overboard because you have to think of it like this. 
These African people had no idea where the ship was taking them. It's not like they told them, we're taking you to this place and we're gonna have you do this, 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 this. They didn't know. In many cases, they thought the people were cannibals. They thought the Europeans, they thought the Portuguese, the Spanish, the English, the French, they thought that they were cannibals. When they, would, when they would bring them up on board the top of the ship, and they'd have this big metal pot, and they're cooking this big stew, and they're stirring it around, the Africans would think, well, are we the main course? They didn't know. I mean, at first meal, they thought they were gonna be, you know, they were gonna be the, 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 the shrimp that they threw in the stew. They had no idea, they realized it, of course. But so, it was, it was a situation where they didn't know what was happening. They were making assumptions. Eventually, they realized that they were taking, they're going to be taken someplace, but they didn't really know. So they fought back. There were mutinies on these ships constantly, but most of the time, they were unsuccessful. The main reason is because the crew members, like I said, they knew that the men were going to try to escape. One of the main ways the men escaped from that compartment down below was that the women and children would sneak weapons to them. Remember I told you about those grates that would be in the top? of this compartment, they would steal a knife or some other weapon and they would walk past it very casually and drop that knife down into the compartment for the men. And then they'd be able to break free of those shackles and try to bust out of that compartment. But the crew members knew it was going to happen. They had men there with weapons, with guns. Sometimes they even had cannons pointed directly into that compartment. So if there was a mutiny, they could put it down very quickly. Some mutinies were successful in terms of taking over the ship, but let's just assume that we go back in time. We have these people who are held in these miserable conditions. They take over the ship. What happens next? They don't know how to drive the ship. They've never seen ships like this. They don't know anything about driving them. So what they have to do is they have to be lucky enough to keep somebody alive who knows how to drive the ship. You guys heard of the, the movie Amistad. Amistad was actually a successful revolt or mutiny to happen on one of these ships. But this is what happened to the people on the Amistad. They didn't really show you this very well in the movie, but what happens is the ship is traveling to the west across the Atlantic Ocean. The Africans are forcing those crew members that are still alive to drive that way because they know where, where they are based on where the sun is, right? So now during the day when the sun is in the sky, they're driving west. Sun goes down, they don't know which direction they're going. The crew members slowly turn back east. And so they're going west and east and west and east. And this ship takes this zigzag journey. And it was supposed to land in one place, but it ended up off the coast of Long Island. And eventually they were given their freedom by the US government. John Quincy Adams actually represented them in court. So it's a fascinating story. But in most cases, when these mutinies happened, they weren't going to be successful. Basically what would happen is, if they did take over the ship, everybody would die. Because the ship would just float around and, you know, everybody would die. Or, oftentimes, the ship would get caught in a storm. Everybody on board would die. So, if you did try to mutiny, you were typically not going to be successful. And if you were successful enough, you had that mutiny close enough to the coast of Africa, you were lucky enough to get back to Africa. Africa is a huge place. It's the second largest continent on the planet. So. Let's just say you left a place that we now call Ghana. You get the ship turned around, you may end up somewhere far, farther north. You may end up in Senegal, or you may end up further south in Angola. You never know. You're probably not going to be fortunate enough to go back to the place that you were. And even if you did, let's just say you left Elmina Castle, which is this fortress they were held in, and you get the ship, and it's maybe a couple miles out, and you knew that you take over, and you turn it around, and you go back. Why would you go back to that place? There's still people there waiting with guns to recapture you, and that's what would happen. So most of the time, these journeys would be unsuccessful in terms of mutinies taking place. 15 to 20 percent of the Africans typically die along this journey. They would die from diseases. These ships were filthy, and with no bathrooms, they typically had a big kettle or something that the men could use as a bathroom. They gave them very small amounts of food and water. Typically, they didn't get fresh water. They had a container with water in it that would have all types of bugs in it, roaches crawling around in it, rats all over these ships. These ships were filthy. And so one of the diseases that was very common on these ships was a disease they used to call at that time the bloody flux. Nowadays we call it dysentery. And the way this disease works is you get these little microorganisms from drinking dirty contaminated water and they begin to literally eat your intestines. And you get very, very sick. And in most cases, back at that time, if you got this disease, you were typically gonna die from it. And the manifestation of it, the way you knew someone had it, was they get this bloody mucusy discharge coming out of their rear end. 
That's how you knew someone had the bloody flux. And you knew that they were probably gonna die. So, if you had, say, 150 Africans on board, and you noticed that, say, 15 of them were sick, well, you're gonna take those 15, chuck them overboard. You don't want them to make anybody else sick. So they would do this quite often because they knew it's not a big deal. They had insurance. If the Africans died from something, if you have to kill some of them during a mutiny, you, you didn't care, you would just pay for them later. You filed an insurance claim for them later. In 1731, there was a French ship that had about 175 Africans on board. They had run into a storm which delayed their, their getting to their destination. And so, as a result of that, they were running very low on food and water. So they had to make a choice. Do we give enough food and water to everybody to keep everybody kind of alive? Or do we just get rid of some of them so we can keep the rest alive and we have a significant amount to sell once we get to New York? So what they decided was to take 50 of those who were most sickly people and just toss them into the Atlantic Ocean. And they thought they were okay because the insurance companies had always paid before when you had to throw people overboard for those reasons, they paid. But in this particular case, the insurance company said, I'm not gonna pay. And so they end up losing that money that they would have gained for those 50 individuals that they threw overboard. One of the other things that happens is sharks begin to follow their ships. Mm -hmm. They see that people are splashing down, people are jumping overboard, people are being tossed overboard. They begin to follow the ships because it's easy access to a meal. And even to this day, sailors say that ships leave in Western Africa, they notice sharks, pools of sharks following the ships because it happened for such a long period of time it became habitual for the sharks. So this journey we call the Middle Passage is very, very difficult. And the people that were on board the ship as a cargo, these African men and children, were typically younger people. When they went to Africa, they didn't want to get old people. They didn't want to get really, really young people. They typically got people from the age of about 10 to about the age of 30. They didn't want anybody outside of their age range. The majority of people they took were males because they wanted them to do physical labor, but they knew they needed a certain number of females to procreate in the New World so that they could continue to have even more slaves in the New World. And so during the course of all of this, I told you guys that 12 to 15 million people were transported but one of the things that's left out of your history books, that every African that arrived safely in the Americas, four to five of them died in Africa as a result of this trade in, in human beings. So let, let's do the math. If it's five, 12 to 15 million, that means 60 to 75 million Africans died on the continent of Africa as a result of this trade before they even got to a ship. And we always count, oh, 15% of them died in the journey, and that means the, 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 the numbers that died were burning, blah, 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 blah. We never count these people, or very rarely do we count them. So we have to count those people as well when we're talking about the tragedy of the Atlantic slave trade. It didn't just impact those people who got on the ships. It impacted millions of Africans on the continent who died as a direct result of this business. And it was a business. It was run as if it was a business. They insured the ships. They kept logs of how the Africans died. They kept logs of what they ate, how much they ate. They kept logs. They, they kept logs of everything. The captain of the ship was responsible for detailing the loss of every single individual. He had to tell the owners of the ship how they died because he lost cargo. Yes, sir. Uh, what was the result of the four to five that died that never left Africa? Were they killed or? Many of them died in wars fighting one another. Many of them died being walked to these fortresses along the coast of West Africa. And so what happens is, just imagine this. A guy actually did a study. And he said, I want to see what the change in population was from 1600 until 1900. And so he looked at all of this data, and he came to the conclusion that the population of Europe from 1600 to 1900, that population tripled over those 300 years, okay? He looked at the population of Africa, and he found that the population of Africa was pretty much the same 300 years later. So imagine that. The population didn't really move, didn't increase at all over a period of 300 years because of all of these deaths associated with the Atlantic slave trade. Yes, So the, the result of uh, the slavery caused the war in Africa, or was it the people that were being uh, picked up were they the strong ones and the family was left with, with uh, not having a, a person to help them? No, primarily, that, 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 that played a certain part in it because children were left as orphans. But for the most part, most of the people who died 
died in these little, what they call internists and wars that they fought. As I mentioned earlier, as Europeans came and began to, to, to extract these slaves that were there, they began to extract these men, women, and children that they wanted, they forced African groups to battle against one another. They would go to one particular village and they'd say, we'll give you guns if you go across the river and attack your neighbors and bring them back and sell them. If you don't take the guns, we'll go over and give them the guns and see what they say. And so you either become a slave raider and attack and kill these people, bring them people, those people back, or they come and do the same thing to you. So it becomes this, this thing where you, know, you have to fight to survive. And many, many millions of people are going to be killed. And oftentimes, after they are captured, they're going to walk hundreds of miles to where these fortresses are, where the ships are waiting. And they're going to die along the way, be attacked by animals, fall over the side of a cliff, whatever. That lots of people are going to die. So all of these people are dying as a result of this business. Okay? So let's move on. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Could you just repeat the, the estimated number you said for that died this, on account of yes, Africa? Sir. We're looking at somewhere between 60 and 75 million people okay. that died on the continent of Africa as a result of this trade before the ships even arrived. So before they even got to the fortresses where they would be held, all of these people died. And so you see the impact that it had on Africa. And remember, these are young people. These are people that have skills. So you're taking the best and the brightest away what's left. And so you wonder why after all of this stuff ends, after 350 years of this, why Africa was in such horrible conditions. Because, I mean, it just broke the fabric of, of so many societies in West Africa. So, you would come to this public auction. This is in May of 1829. Public auction. And they announced what's for sale. The following slaves, and they would give you a description of them. They would tell you, you know, what condition they were in, how old they were. And then they'd tell you some of the other things that they were selling as well. And if you look down here, for sale, they're selling rice, books, needles, pins, ribbons. When you went to these public auctions, they sold these human beings as if they were just some other commodity to be sold. I mean, you could come and buy a horse, and then go buy three black people. That was the way it was. And so this was the business of selling humans, and it was a huge business in the United States. There, were, there was a huge auction house just a couple blocks away from the White House where you could go and buy African men, women, and children. There was a huge market uh, in, in New York City. Uh, these markets were all over the coast of, of, of America. One of the things I found very interesting, I actually looked at some of the places where these, these big auctions took place. And back during 2005, when Hurricane Katrina hit, it was almost like Hurricane Katrina knew about slavery. Because what happens when it hit the Gulf Coast, the areas that it hit, that it impacted the most, were areas that were huge markets for slaves. The biggest in the country was New Orleans. So we all obviously know what happened in New Orleans, but Mobile, Alabama, all part, Biloxi, Mississippi, all of these small places along the coast of, of, of Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, even parts of Texas, were big parts where these Africans would be brought in to be sold. And so it was almost like Hurricane Katrina knew where these places were. So this was an auction house. And I mean, they weren't shy about it. It's not like this was a big secret. They were very open about selling African men with their children. So you could go to this company who were dealers in slaves. That was their business. They were dealers in men, women, and children. Okay? So let's talk about the auction block. To me, the auction block is really uh, one of the, the most tragic parts of this whole journey that Africans take. The reason I say this is because once you arrive in the New World, let's just say you're arriving in the United States, if you were fortunate, you may have had an intact family. You may have had a husband, a wife, a couple of children, whatever. If you were lucky. In most cases, probably not in the United States. In Brazil, they really tried to keep families together. The Portuguese have this thing about, you know, even though we're enslaving these people, we're still treating them as if they're Christians. Because what the Portuguese would do is when they loaded that ship up with African men, women, and children, they would actually baptize all of those Africans on board the ship before it left Africa. Because they, they felt that, you know, these people are Christians. Even though we're mistreating them, the Bible says we, we can't enslave Christians, but we're violating that. But at least we're going to give them some of this, this, this warmth and comfort that comes from being a Christian. The United States, they didn't care about that. It was completely irrelevant. They didn't have any, any uh, uh, 
ill feelings about breaking up families in the United States. Very rarely that they look and say, oh, we shouldn't do this. So we have the auction block. After you leave, these are some of the things you're going to have to endure. But let's go to the auction block and talk about what happens. So let's just say you have this auction house in Washington, D.C., right? And so on an allotted day and time, a group of people come, much like yourselves. You're here to buy African men, women, and children. Now, you're here to buy them for a variety of different reasons. Contrary to popular belief, everybody didn't buy an African to have them work for the rest of their lives. Slavery wasn't a lifetime institution all the time in the United States. It really didn't become a lifetime of servitude for these Africans really until like the mid-1600s. The first Africans that came to the United States were brought over in 1619. And they were sold by a Dutch slaving ship for food. They ran out of food. They didn't have any food left. And they, they ran into Jamestown, Virginia, and they traded these Africans they had on board who they were planning to go and sell. They traded them for some food. And so they were able to survive after that. So the laws in the United States took a while to make slavery a lifetime institution. So really, for the first 50 or so odd years, in most places, slavery wasn't lifetime. They would be enslaved for a period of time and then they'd be given their freedom. But the laws changed. I think Massachusetts was the first state to make slavery a lifetime <coughs> institution. So now, we have this auction block where people are here to buy them because they want to have people who are laborers. They want people who can work on rice plantations, sugarcane plantations, tobacco, whatever it may be. But they also buy them for other reasons. Let's just say you're, you're, you're a family who has a young son or young daughter and they're an only child. You want, you'll buy them a playmate. So you would go and buy a young African child as their playmate. And these children will be grow up together and they'd be best of friends. But then once they got to about 15, 16 years of age, the relationship would change. And all of a sudden, you know, the father who had been master is now, you know, kind of old and now he wants his son to take over. And now that child who had been your best friend for all of these years, all of a sudden is now master. And so now, he owns you. You're not his friend anymore. Now he owns you. So that would be one of the reasons. You could also use these Africans as collateral. Let's just say you own 15 Africans and you have all of these debtors that are coming after you. You can use the Africans to pay off the debt. Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson was terrible with money. I mean, he was absolutely horrible with money. He squandered so much money building the University of Virginia and this huge Monticello. And what ends up happening, debtors come after him. They're like, you owe us money. You have to pay. And so eventually he gets to the point where he has to sell almost every African that he owns. He owned during the course of his life over 200 African men, women, and children. I think the most he ever owned at any particular time was like 150, 160, somewhere in that area. So later in life, when all of these debtors are coming after him, he actually sells a bunch of these Africans that he owns to pay off debts. You could also use them as collateral, go to the bank and get a loan. You could use them to pay off somebody. If you had somebody who owed you $500, well, you don't have $500 here. I'm going to sell you one of my men or women or child that's valued at $500 instead. So they were very valuable in many ways other than just being a person who's going to work for you. Because really, the, the young children couldn't work. And one of the bargains you can make on the auction block. If there was a pregnant woman, you're getting two for the price of one. Because the laws in the United States said this, as a child, if you're born and your mother is free, you're born into freedom. If your mother is enslaved, you're born into slavery. So if you buy a pregnant woman, you're getting two for the price of one. So the price of that pregnant woman would actually be higher than a woman who wasn't pregnant. Typically young, strong men, who had skills were the most valuable. Young, attractive females were very valuable. I read this one story about a young girl who was 14 years old, was sold in New Orleans. And there were all of these very wealthy men who bought, just randomly bought these, these young women as, as sex slaves for them, basically, as concubines. And so they would compete to see who had the most, you know, beautiful concubine. And so these men debated back and forth over the price of this young girl, and they eventually paid, well, at that time, now imagine this, at that time they paid $5,000 for this 14-year-old girl, and this was in the 1830s. So they paid huge amounts of money sometimes. So when we look at it, it's a business, and it gives you benefits outside of just owning people because my family, I trace my family history. I'm from Mississippi. And when I was tracing my family history, I was fortunate enough to come across 
uh, the name of the person who owned my family. His name was Dipsy Diltz. He was from Germany. He had, he had migrated over from Germany, moved to Virginia, uh, lived there for a number of years, and then ended up buying some African men, women, children, moved to Mississippi. And there was this huge, huge numbers of Africans who were taken from Virginia, South Carolina, and transported <coughs> to Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, places like that in the 1820s, 1830s. So some of my relatives came over to Mississippi in that way. So Dempsey Diltz. I ran across one of his, I think it was his great, 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 great granddaughter. She was tracing her family history. And so I was looking for information on Dempsey Dills. I left a message on this message board. She got back to me. She ended up sending me his entire family tree. She sent me a copy of his wife Mary's will. And in this will, I wish I had a copy. I wish I would have made a copy and show it to you guys. But in this will, she's talking about, I'm giving this to this person, this to that person. So she's talking about all the things that she owns that she's giving away when she passes away. So she's talking about this, you know, the land she's going to give to this daughter because the daughter has a husband and she wants them to have this land. She has a son and she's going to give this son you know, these horses, these cows, some farm equipment, and three slaves. And then he's going to move, he eventually moves to Texas with those, those three people from my family. And so I can see that these people are selling my relatives just as if they were selling, you know, a, a, a shovel. No difference. They're giving these people away because it's part of what they possess. Think of it like this. This is the most important value that they had. The value is that they weren't white. Slavery was an institution designed for black people only. People can tell you that the first Africans came over weren't really slaves, they were indentured servants. I differ. I don't care how many historians have written that they were. They were slaves. They were treated as slaves because this, this indentured servitude is this, 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 this institution that existed for a number of years. Poor whites in different places in London and, and, and all of these other big cities, Bristol, all of these places. They were poor whites all over the place. Homeless people and they wanted these people to come to the United States and work in factories. But they didn't want to really pay them. So what they did is they said, you know, you're living in, in, in horrible conditions. You're homeless. You can't, can't find food to eat. We're going to give you an escape from that. We're going to give you passage across the Atlantic on a ship. But you're going to have to work seven years to pay off that debt. Anywhere from four to seven years. And after they worked that four to seven years, they were given their freedom. They could do whatever they wanted to do. And many times they were given a small piece of land or whatever. But think about it. If you're a white person, you could escape and just blend in. I mean, nobody would really notice. But if you were a black person who was enslaved and you escaped, eh, you kind of stand out like a sore thumb. <laughs> so even though indentured servitude was there and it was horrible, the conditions on those ships were horrific as well, it wasn't a situation that was comparable to slavery. Even though I've heard people argue that it was about to say, no, it wasn't. It's nothing close to being the same because, like I said, this institution became a lifelong institution only for blacks and men. So, we see here this man, this photograph was taken in the 1850s. There was a doctor, and he was trying to prove to everyone who would listen that blacks did not suffer the same way whites suffered. He said that their emotional pain when they lost a family member wasn't the same as whites. He said that when they were whipped, they didn't feel pain the same way whites did. So he set out to prove this. And so he took pictures of people like this who have been whipped. And you can see this man has been whipped just horrifically during the course of his life. He used these images and, and other documentation to prove that even though this man had been beaten unmercifully for many, many years, the pain was there, but it wasn't all that bad. And this guy was a, was a medical doctor trying to prove this. So let's, let's talk about the justification for enslaving Africans. I told you guys that they came over as a replacement labor force for the Indians, right? Initially. The Europeans said, well, we need justification for enslaving these people. Well, they're heathens. They're not Christians. Because if you look at Africa, how many guys have seen Ruth? <laughs> okay? I saw it when I was a child. I remember <coughs> I was a child in the 70s watching and I was like, wow, this is just fascinating. And then they, they replayed it again about maybe, I don't know, five years ago or something. And I watched it and I noticed things that I didn't notice the first time I watched it. And one of the things I noticed, and, and, and it really reverberated with me, was Kunta Kinte was a Muslim. <laughs> I kept hearing him say Allah, Allah. I mean, continuously during, during the, the film, I kept hearing him say Allah. When I was a kid, I didn't know what it meant. 
I had never heard of Muslims in my life. I didn't know what Islam was. But as an adult, I recognized it right away. And it, it reverberated with me because I realized that a large number of these Africans who came over that the Europeans said were heathens weren't heathens. They were Muslims. They didn't believe in Christianity, but they had a religion that was very similar to Christianity in many ways. It's actually, a, a, they birthed from the same, same place. Islam, Christianity, and Judaism are, are permanently connected to one another. So their initial justification was that they were heathens. Then they began to baptize them. And people said, well, now they're Christians, so what's our justification now? The next justification was that they are the descendants of Ham. And it says in the Bible that these people are supposed to be treated badly for the rest of mankind. But then people start saying, no, wait a minute now. Okay, these are the descendants of Ham. So Noah had this son by the name of Ham. So that meant that Ham must have been black. Hmm, how did Noah have a black son? Well, that story isn't gonna work. So they threw that one in the trash real quick. And the next justification was simply that they are a different species of humanity. They are a different species of humanity. They're humans, kinda but they're not like the rest of us. So that was a lasting justification. And when you say that these people are not part of the human family, then you have to prove that they're not part of the human family. And they began to do experiments on blacks. They measured the texture of their hair, the thickness of their lips, the thickness of their, they measured everything. Private parts, every, no part was left untouched. No part was unstudied to prove that they were separate species of humanity than whites were. And so that justification lasted, and really that justification led directly to the racism that we even have even currently. So, let's talk about emancipation. Yes? One thing I was thinking was that the slave system in the Bible was nothing like this kind of slavery. It was Bible, if you were treated badly, you could walk away from your owner, and that was it. Exactly. Remember, I, I talked earlier about this form of slavery being called chattel slavery. Yeah. The, the slavery you read about in the Bible, the slavery that existed everywhere before this enslavement, yeah. it wasn't chattel slavery. You weren't anybody's personal property. This became personal property. And so it completely changed the way you looked at the people who were enslaved. Yes, sir? Yeah, going back to religious, uh, and you mentioned the Muslims. <laughs> well, wasn't that because a lot of way before the Englishmen or the Britishmen had entered Africa that the Arabic was, they was enslaved in Africa. Yes, absolutely. So they, they became uh, under the Arabic religious because they was ruling, I mean, they came and invaded Africa. Well, that was part of it, but really it wasn't an invasion like we think. What happened is these trading routes, Africans and West Africa traded with people from North Africa, from East Africa, there was huge trading routes that they used to take and, and go back and forth. The Africans in West Africa, uh, like the, the one of, one of their, their, their most prominent kingdoms, Mali, the Mali kingdom was very wealthy in gold. So if you wanted gold, that was the place to go. So people from far and wide, from the Middle East, from Northern Africa would come to buy gold from the people in Western Africa. And so you built, built these trading relationships. Along with those trading relationships became an introduction of Islam. Now some of the leaders accepted Islam as their language and then they forced the other people, listen, if I'm gonna be Muslim, you are gonna be a Muslim too. So they kind of forced it on people. But what happens though is the people never really fully accepted it in that particular way because they knew also that these people from the, from the East were taking them away in shackles as well. There was a large number of Africans who were taken and sold in India, sold it throughout the Middle East as well. A much smaller percent, of course, than the ones that were taken to, to the Americas, but there were people, so you're exactly right about that. But what happens though, is even though Islam is there, it kind of, and even though they introduced them to Christianity eventually, it kind of molds into their, their traditional beliefs. So they kind of change Christianity, they, try to, they change Islam. So it's practiced, but it's practiced differently than it's practiced anywhere else. Yes, sir? I think Mohammed himself had uh, one of his early friends who was black and was one of the first two or three people to call himself a Muslim. <laughs> so they were very open. And they may have slaves, but they're very open to uh, people of any race being free. There was no racism at that time. Yeah. Racism didn't exist at that time. Yeah, that was, uh, not, uh, there's this saying from Angela Davis that, mm -hmm. you know, that racism preceded race, that the people came from Europe, looked at Africa, 
you said here were all these people without great weapons. Let's you know figure out a way to use them and not pay them. Well, what are we going to say about it? Well, they look around and they say, hey, they look sort of black. Let's say there's a black race and a white race, and now it's perfectly fine to enslave these black people. But it, th so that, that, the that's, racism was first. That that's a very simplified way of looking at it because this change this idea of race as as we view it today took place over a long period of time it wasn't just like oh some white people in africa and some black people all oh, they're different mother it didn't happen that way they knew that there were people that looked different africans had been uh, doing business with europeans for many years before this throughout different parts of africa it wasn't like this was the first time whites and blacks had encountered one another i mean if you go back through history you'll see that that blacks from all different parts especially north in Eastern Africa had business with Europeans for many years. This is the first time they had done business with people from Western Africa. But it's not like they had never seen black people before. So that's a very simplified explanation of how it worked. It took place over a long period of time and went through multiple justifications before we got to this, this idea of the social construct that we call race, yeah. where we define people by how they look. Yes, sir. Well, uh, after the Africans that came to America, was it true that uh, they were not only enslaved by white, but after some Indian tribes enslaved the blacks. Yes, absolutely. And there were blacks who owned slaves as well. And, and blacks. Yes. Because, let's look at it this way. It's a business. It's a business. You own property. They're just another type of property. So it, it's not like, oh, uh, I'm a black person. I, I don't want to be rich. I'm not going to own anybody. Many of the blacks who owned slaves, though, they bought their own family members. They bought their freedom. They would go back and buy their wife and their children. So it, in the history books, oh, this person was a slave owner. He really wasn't. He just went and purchased the freedom of his family. But on paper, he's a slave owner. And so, I mean, it's, it's, it's complicated, but that, that's really how we have to look at it. And so let's talk about the Emancipation Proclamation. You've all heard of the Emancipation Proclamation, but you've been lied to about the Emancipation Proclamation your entire life. The Emancipation Proclamation was issued January 1st, 1863 by President Abraham Lincoln. It only applied to 10 of the 15 slave states. I always tell people, don't read about the Emancipation Proclamation, read the Emancipation Proclamation. It says very specifically what places these people are freed in. And only in 10 of the states are they actually supposedly given freedom by this document. This left the slave populations in Maryland, Delaware, Missouri, Kentucky, and Tennessee, and a large portion of Virginia and Louisiana still enslaved. There were four states that were called the border states that never joined the Confederacy and fought against the United States in the Civil War. Maryland, Delaware, Missouri, Kentucky. 21% of the enslaved population in the country lived in those four states. So they never joined the Confederacy. They left themselves as part of the United States. So these four border states and these people that were in Virginia, parts of Louisiana and Tennessee, if you count those, that's about 28% of the enslaved population was not freed by Abraham Lincoln when he wrote the Emancipation Proclamation. Why wasn't it? Well, it's complicated, but it really is easy. The news of the Emancipation Proclamation didn't reach all parts of the United States right away. It wasn't like instant communication, like you send somebody a text message, oh, we're free. You know, it didn't happen that way. People didn't know. People in Texas didn't find out until two years after, after it was issued because they kept it a secret from them. They, people couldn't read and write. They, it was against the law to teach them to read and write. So even if somebody tried to you know, show them a newspaper or what, they weren't going to find out. So we have this celebration called Juneteenth Day that we celebrate in many parts of the United States. That's the date that these blacks found out. But let's get back to why these, these four border states, they weren't free. This is what happens. You have the Civil War. At the time, the South is kicking the butts of the North. They're winning decisively. It's not even close. Lincoln is, is afraid that, that he's going to be run out of office because he's losing the war. So he needs some measure to, 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 to bring excitement not only to the American people, but also to the people who are paying for the war, the English and the French. Where do you think the money came from to fight the Civil War? They were borrowing money left and right from, from England and France, the South and the North. So the Confederates were borrowing money, the North was borrowing money from the same people to fight the war. And so he wanted to, to, to give these people the impression that, that his side was, was more valuable. So he issued this proclamation. And he went to those four border states and said, I want you to free your slaves. I'm going to issue this proclamation. They're going to be free. And they said, well, hold on a minute. We're still part of the United States. You got to pay us for those people. If you want us to free them, pay us. 
We can't just tell these slave owners, oh, you got to free your slaves. Without paying them, you have to compensate them. And he said, well, I don't have any money. I'm fighting this war. I can't compensate them. And so he said, okay, well, I'll just leave those four states out. And those other areas, Virginia, Louisiana, Tennessee, I'm still perplexed as to why he left Tennessee out. I think a big part of it was that a, a big portion of Tennessee really didn't have a lot of slavery in it. And it was kind of a, a mixed bag in terms of who supported which side in Tennessee. You know, some people supported the northern side, some people supported the Confederate. So it was kind of one of those places where he was kind of a mixed. He couldn't really say one way or another whether they would accept it if he freed their slaves. So that's the lesson about the Emancipation Proclamation that they didn't teach you in school. Yes, sir. I'm just curious if you know why or or how uh, on June was celebrated now as Juneteenth Day, the people in Texas did find out. Oh, they found out. Uh, uh, there's a there's a general who came into town, uh, a Union general who came into town to spread the news with him because he, he knew from hearing stories that people certain certain parts of Texas they had never told the black people about the Emancipation Proclamation. Now this was in in the summer of 1865, June 19th, Civil War had already ended three months before this. So really, I mean, the thing to remember though is that the Emancipation Proclamation did not end slavery. The 13th Amendment to the Constitution ended slavery. That wasn't ratified and became law until 1865, December 13th, 1865. So it was six months after this general told them that they were free when official freedom came was December of 1865. That's when slavery ended officially. Mm -hmm. So, let's continue to talk. Even though the 13th Amendment to the Constitution in our history books were told it ended slavery, it, it made slavery illegal. It didn't. Because, once again, don't read about the 13th Amendment, read the 13th Amendment. And it said very clearly that slavery and involuntary servitude is illegal from this point forward, except as punishment for a crime you've been convicted of. That's what it says. It doesn't say slavery is illegal, and just leave it at that. It says slavery and involuntary servitude are illegal moving forward, except as a punishment for a crime you've been convicted of. People took advantage of the language of that, and they began to pass laws specifically to capture blacks and re-enslave them. And really, this, this re-enslavement was widespread. There was a great documentary done uh, called Slavery by Another Name, a great book that accompanies it. I, I recommend it to everybody. Get the documentary, watch it. I mean, you'll see the details of how this worked. Millions and millions of people were still enslaved even after slavery ended, and there were a variety of different measures. This picture was a young man who was held at a prison labor camp in Alabama and forced to work for free after slavery ended. One of the, the methods they used was called debt peonage labor and also sharecropping. Now, debt peonage labor, let's just say you're a young black man, you're walking down the street, and this happened to many people that showed them in the documentary. You're just walking down the street, minding your business, a white person comes up to you and says, you owe me money. I've never seen you before in my life. You owe me money. I've never seen you before. I'm going to take you at gunpoint to the sheriff's office and have him arrest you because you haven't paid me this debt that you owe me. I've never seen you in my life. How can I owe you money? Well, what side do you think the sheriff's going to take? Obviously, we know what side he took. And so now this person is thrown in jail and you have to stay in jail or you could pay this debt to this man. So guess what happens? You don't have any money to pay this debt that you don't really owe anybody, so somebody else comes in and pays the debt for you. So guess what? Now you have to go work for them for an extended period of time. It happened multiple times. Or they would pass laws, vagrancy laws, where a group of black men who were out of work, sitting around, talking, playing checkers or whatever they were playing, somebody would come in, arrest all of them for vagrancy, and then they have to have somebody pay for them to get out of jail and as a result of that person paying for them to get out of jail, you have to work for them for free. It's slavery by another name. Yes, sir? Uh, this doesn't apply simply to blacks either. Uh, a lot of the uh, hobos, food tramps, would travel around the country and they knew that you did not go south in the summer because you'd wind up in a chain gang. Absolutely. Uh, but you could, you could go down and work down there. They'd be happy to have you. I mean, not bother you. Absolutely. I agree with that, but the extent of that 
It's so small. Oh, I know. I know. It's, I mean, it's minimal. If you look at these, the records of these prison camps, and this documentary, <clears throat> Slavery by Another Name, does a great job of documenting it. If you look at the records, almost everybody, practically everybody, 99% were blacks. So even though whites, you know, these laws were race neutral, supposedly, but the people that they arrested were primarily black men. So even though the law was race neutral, it only applied to blacks. And some of the laws were written specifically for crimes that applied to blacks, but didn't apply to whites. So you can commit the exact same crime, but if you're black, you go to jail. If you're white, nothing. So it was supposedly race neutral, but really the, the, the people that really were impacted were blacks primarily. Yes, sir. <clears throat> what would be the political reason they put that into the 13th Amendment about if you committed a crime, you could be enslaved like that? Why they put that in? Money. Let's, let, well, let's, let's go back to slavery. And he said, why, why would they put that in the 13th Amendment? Why would they put that word in? Let's go back to 1787 when the Constitution was passed. 1776, the Declaration of Independence, 1787, the Constitution. They had all of these amendments and blah, blah, blah. If you look at that document, there's something very special about that document. One, at least 10 parts of the Constitution have direct bearing on slavery in one, one, one way or another. Secondly, the word slave and slavery are nowhere in those documents. Look at the Constitution. You won't see the word slave or slavery. Blacks are described numerous times, but they're called other persons. There's a clause of it called the three-fifths clause. And this clause, the way representation in Congress works, you have the House of Representatives and you have the Senate. Each state gets two senators and then your House of Representatives based on your population. So the northern states who had gotten rid of slavery many years before, even though they tried to tell you that it was never slavery in New York and New Jersey, it was slavery in practically every, all the original 13 colonies with the exception of, of Vermont and Maine had slavery on the books. No, Vermont did for a short period of time. Maine never had it. So all of these eastern, eastern states got rid of slavery many, many years before. But what happens is when you're looking at this debate over how representation is going to take place. The, the slave states want to have as much power as they can versus the northern states who are non-slave states at this time. So what happens is this. They say, well, a majority of our population in South Carolina are blacks. A majority of our population in Virginia is black. We have to count them. Otherwise, we're not properly represented in Congress. So they debate it, debate it, debate it, debate it, debate it. And they come to a resolution and they say, okay, look, we're not going to count all the blacks, but we'll count three out of every five. So it eventually becomes this idea that the blacks were counted as three-fifths of a person, which in reality is not what it said, but in reality is how it really worked. So every black person was not counted. Three of every five will be counted. And so that's a big part of the U.S. Constitution. That's one of the biggest parts because it really affected the political power in the country for many years after that. So you look at the Constitution. Slave and slavery is not mentioned. Slaves and slavery were part and parcel of the founding of the nation. 13 of the first 16 U.S. presidents were slave owners, including Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, George Washington owned nearly 500 African men, women, and children. Thomas Jefferson owned over 200. So slavery was just, you know, it, it, was, it, was, it was a part of America. It was as American as apple pie. So really, ending slavery really was like, okay, we're really, we're ending it, but do we really want to change those relationships so drastically? Because there were people from the South who were part of this ratification procedure as well, who fought to make sure that they would have some mechanism to keep treating blacks similar to the way they were treated during the days of slavery. Yes, ma'am? Well, I think it's also um, mainly economic. Without um, slaves, um, who's going to run all these plantations and do all this work? And so there had to be a mechanism in which um, laborers had to be found. And so this was a continuation of slavery by another name. Absolutely, absolutely. So money is the, it's the money god. It's a business. It's a business. If you look at the, at the southern states that broke away and formed the Confederacy, and when they drew up their constitution, almost word for word the same as the U.S. Constitution, except when they're talking about the slaves, they said slaves, and they said slavery. That's the big difference. But 41% of the wealth in those southern states in 1860, when they did the census, 41% of the wealth was wealth and ownership of black men, women, and children. 
So imagine this. They tell you in, in history class, well, a uh, civil war was fought because it was about states' rights. Nonsense. It was about slavery. It was about slavery. Abraham Lincoln even admitted it numerous times that had slavery not existed, we would have never fought this, this tragic war. So if somebody's coming to you and, 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 and they pick up your purse and they say, I'm going to take 41% of your money, you can have the rest, you're going to be willing to fight. And so when this institution ends, where are you going to get the workers? Where are you going to get them from? You, you freed nearly 4 million people from working for free and you're accustomed to them working for free. That's where your profit margin comes from. Now I'm gonna have to pay them? Are you kidding me? You think I wanna, this guy was working for me for 10 years for free and now all of a sudden I'm gonna pay him? I'm gonna put some mechanism in place where I don't have to pay him. Sharecropping. Blacks were given the ability to live on the land that they used to work on. They picked the cotton out of the ground and at the end of the year, the books are due, and the, the owner of the land says, well, okay, you owe me for this, you owe me for that, you owe me for this, you owe me for that, you owe me for this, and this is how much you gave me in cotton. Ah, oh, man, you're about $100 short, buddy. <laughs> Guess what? You got to work another year. Oh, in the, in the next year, $120 short, buddy. And this continues for generation after generation, because guess what? One, many of the blacks didn't learn how to read and write because it was illegal. Secondly, even if you could read and write and you challenged them, you were not going to be successful. You were going to either be beaten or killed for challenging these books. And we'll talk about that shortly. Let's move on. This is a prison labor camp in Georgia. And look at the faces. Do you see any white faces in there? They're all black. They're all black. Some of them look like children. Many of them were children. This is Pratt Mines, a, a big, big company in Birmingham, Alabama. Most of the munitions that were made for the Confederate States of America were built at the Pratt Mines during the war. And they had this labor camp that they ran after the war ended. So let's talk about... What was that? First World War? Civil War. Civil War. Civil War. So let's talk about... I always like to, 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 to clarify what white supremacy means. When we think of white supremacy, the first thing that pops to our minds is what? KKK. KKK. Ku Klux Klan, skinheads, neo-Nazis, whatever, right? That's not what white supremacy is. White supremacy, it, it, this is what it means. Supremacy means that you have supremacy over somebody. You're in a superior position, they're in an inferior position. Most of the whites who ran the country wanted whites to maintain this position of superiority over blacks. So that means they wanted whites to be superior. That's what white supremacy means. It doesn't mean, oh, we're going to hate you because you're black, or we're going to mistreat you because you're black. We want to make sure that white people are in control. That's what white supremacy is. That's where it came from. It's part of the fabric of America. It's been that way forever. I showed you guys a quote earlier about Abraham Lincoln's views. We'll get back to that. Ku Klux Klan, the first terrorist organization, the first organized terrorist group in the U.S., Pulaski, Tennessee, after the Civil War ended, a group of Confederate soldiers were very upset that they had lost. And so, and you notice the date here? December 24th, 1865? That was just a week and a half after the 13th Amendment was ratified. And they started the Ku Klux Klan. And the original Ku Klux Klan, basically their mission was to terrorize blacks and to allow white people to remain in a supreme position by any means necessary. If they have to beat them, kill them, whip them, whatever, it didn't really make a difference, they were going to do whatever they had to do to maintain that supremacy of whites. They became so bad in terms of the damage they were doing, the people they were killing, that the U.S. government outlawed them. In 1877, they passed the Ku Klux Klan Act, which outlawed the Klan, and the Klan kind of went away. But they came back later. 1915, the Klan was reborn. And now they came back as this, this Protestant organization that stood for, you know, uh, people, morally correct people. Not drinking, not mistreating your wife, all of these wonderful things that they stood for. But they also said, we hate blacks, we hate Jews, we hate anybody that's not Protestant, so we can't say Catholics. That's what they stood on. That was their platform. And they became extremely popular around the United States. They had millions of members. This is a rally they had in Washington, D.C. 30,000 Klan members marched down Pennsylvania Avenue. 
with about 100,000 bystanders cheering them on. Welcome to town when we love you. This was huge, 1926. This is in Milwaukee. The Klan was prominent in Milwaukee in the 1920s. They had a clavern, as they called it, in Milwaukee. And this is a, a, a celebration they were having on Flag Day in 1924. The public is invited. You know, they had music, lectures, dancing, refreshments. You know, bring your families, all of these different things. And so it was something that was, it was a social organization that many, many people joined, men, women, and children. And it wasn't considered to be some bad group. They had a philosophy they called 100% Americanism. And what that meant was that your butt had to learn English whether you wanted to or not. So guess what happens in Wisconsin? A lot of, a lot of Wisconsin's immigrants were Germans. So they were teaching German in the schools in Wisconsin. Widespread. They were teaching in German because that's the language that people knew. They came up from Germany. They only spoke German. So the Klan and other groups said, we don't want that to happen any longer. They were able to get a law passed that said you can't teach a foreign language in the schools. But the German community said, well, we'll see about that. They challenged it and went to the Wisconsin Supreme Court. The Wisconsin Supreme Court said, well, you know what? You can teach whatever language you want. If you want to speak German, let us speak German. But in other states, it didn't work that way. Other states, they were able to, to, to make, basically make it so you had to speak English only. And doesn't that sound familiar? <laughs> Stop speaking Spanish. I'm tired of this. If you're here in the United States, you need to learn English. Imagine this. Everybody that came to America came from some place that didn't speak English except the people who came from England. The Africans didn't come over and learn English. The people from Switzerland didn't know English. The Germans didn't know English. The Italians didn't know English. The Polish didn't know English. Everybody came over with different languages. The Native Americans obviously didn't know English. But all of a sudden, we, we make it seem as if if, you're, if you don't speak English, you're not American. America is not a melting pot. America is like a salad bowl. You got tomatoes in it. You got different types of lettuce. All of these different wonderful, that's what America is. All of these, these intricate pieces from different places. But some people wanted everybody to be the same. The Klan was one of those groups. This is where we get to the part where I'm gonna show you some very ugly, horrific images. All real images, I'm gonna tell you the stories behind these images. There were lots of lynchings, an estimated somewhere around 5,000 documented lynching cases from the 1880s through the 1960s, and many major race riots. <coughs> The founder of the museum, Dr. James Cameron, survived this lynching in 1930. A little town called Marion, Indiana, which is in North Central Maryland, or Indiana. What happened on this date, August 7, 1930, is when the lynching took place. The day before, Dr. Cameron, who was 16, was out playing with some of his friends, and one of his buddies came over, Abe, Abe Smith, and a friend of his named Thomas Ship. They came over. They said, you want to go with us? We're going to go joyriding around town. He jumped in the car with him. Abe was 18, Thomas was 19. So they're riding around, and then they go out to this area outside of town called the Lover's Lane area, where couples used to go and kind of make out. So they said, okay, uh, James, this is what we want you to do. We're gonna give you this gun, we want you to go over to that car and rob the people in the car. He's like, what, what are you talking about? You know, this is peer pressure is getting to him. So he takes the gun, and he says, okay, I'll go over there. He's going over there, his hand is shaking. He opens the door, and he says, stick him up. He notices the man in the car is a friend of his man by the name of Claude D, who was one of his best customers at his shoe shots day. So he says, I'm not gonna rob this man. This guy's a friend of mine, he gives me great tips. So he gives his friends a gun back, and he starts to run. And he's running, he gets about a quarter mile, and he hears two shots fired. He jumps in some bushes, he's sweating profusely, and then he, he, he comes to his senses, he says, I gotta get back home, I gotta get back home. So he runs about another mile back to his home, he bursts in the front door, his mother's like, what's going on, what happened? He's like, oh, nothing, nothing, I just played football with my friends. He goes upstairs to his bed. He's lying in bed, <coughs> Claude Dieter had been shot, Abe and Tommy have left the scene, a neighbor across the road with a farm heard the shots <coughs> came down, took Claude Dieter and his girlfriend, Mary Ball, to the hospital. He eventually died several hours later, but word spreads because Claude Dieter and the girl, they, they, they finger these three guys that did this, right? So, a mob begins to gather. The police come, they throw the three of them in the jail. Over the, the course of the next eight to 10 hours, a mob of 15,000 gathers out front of the jail, and they take each of these individuals out separately. They take out Abe and Thomas, and they murdered each of them before they hanged them on the tree. They were both dead before they got to the tree, and they hung them on the tree. 
They rammed a crowbar through Abe's stomach and killed him. They beat Thomas unmercifully until he was dead. They went in to get this 16-year-old boy, James Cameron, next. He's in the cell with a group of hobos who are riding the rails. They were arrested, a group of about 30 black men who were arrested for riding the rails. This is during the Great Depression. People are riding from town to town trying to find work. They arrested these men. They're in his jail cell with this young boy. He's trying to hide. These men are trying to protect him. They, they tell the mob leaders, he's not in here. And they begin to go by a pistol whipping people saying, you better tell us where he is, otherwise we're going to kill every one of them. And eventually one of the men shakily points him out. They grab him. They take him out of the cell. They drag him out into the street where this mob is, is just yelling profanities at him, throwing things, cursing. And they put the rope around his neck. And he says at that moment he knew he was going to die. People are hitting him, hitting him with bricks, kicking him, spitting on him, all kinds of things. And he, he says at that moment, he says, you know what, I, I ask God for forgiveness for all of my sins because I knew I was going to die. So they take him very close to the tree. They, they gather. He says it got real quiet. It got real quiet. And all of a sudden, he heard a voice that said, let this young man go. He had nothing to do with the murder or wreck because by now, word has spread that this young girl, Mary Ball, who was with Claudia had been raped, even though she was never touched. Word spread. So this voice says, let this young man go, and he says they let him go. He staggered back to the jail. He got into the jail. About an hour later, the sheriff took him out of the back of the jail and whisked him off to a neighboring town for safekeeping. He was eventually tried as an accessory after the act of murder. And he spent four years in a penitentiary in Indiana. When he got out, he hated white people. He said he was so angry but one thing happened when he was in prison that made him kind of think differently. He says when, he, when that crowd was dragging him and spitting on him and cursing and hitting him, he said he saw so many familiar faces. People he thought were his friends. You know, clergy from the church, people from the school, teachers from the school, everybody in town was there. People from neighboring communities came in on trains to witness this. And he said when he was in prison, the, 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 the guy that was running the prison treated him extremely well actually let him go and run errands for him and stuff, let him do the books for him, and he became this person who had all of this anger, and he said it was still there when he got out, but then he realized that his time in that prison would have been much more miserable than it was had it, been not, had it not been for this white man who treated him very, very well, the warden of the prison. And so he began, began to get that out of his system, and he began to look then for reconciliation. He began to look for somebody to give him forgiveness for his sins, for his part in the murder of Claude Dieter. So he began to open up branches of the NAACP, and eventually he opened America's Black Holocaust Museum in 1988. This is another legend, William Brown. This was in 1919 in Omaha, Nebraska. He was burned alive. He was burned alive. Now, what they did before they burned him alive is they took him out of a jail. He got in the elevator that a white woman was on, and she was frightened by him. So she ran off the elevator and said, this black man just got on the elevator and scared me. And so they threw him in jail. So a group of blacks gathered downtown because they thought they were going to lynch him. A group of whites, they, they actually had a gun battle. Eventually, the sheriff broke it up. And they said, you know, when they make sure no lynching happens tonight, the white mob came back later, busted into the jail very easily took William Brown out, tied him to a trolley pole, and they began to take pot shots, just shooting him. Shooting him in the arms, the legs, feet, making sure they didn't kill him, just shooting him. They took him down, threw him on this pile of wood, poured kerosene oil on him, set him afire. The mayor tried to intervene. They put a rope around the mayor's neck, tied him up on the same trolley pole. Luckily for him, the sheriff saved his life. But after this happened, a major race riot occurred in Omaha. 1923, Tulsa, Oklahoma, race riot. Whites went into the black section of town and leveled 35 square blocks. They looted homes, looted businesses, burned churches. The largest black-owned hotel in the country was in Tulsa, Oklahoma. This land where the blacks live, many very wealthy white men in town had been trying for years to figure out how they could get that land for themselves to build factories on. So there was an incident that sparked all of this, and before you knew it, at least 300 blacks were killed, black churches were burned to the ground, black businesses, all of these different things. I'm going to show you guys some images of this event. These are images that I got from the library in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And you can kind of see 
the damage that was done. 35 square blocks completely destroyed by fire. And the blacks who were there were captured, taken, put in this, this kind of pen where they were held, not for their safety, but so they couldn't retaliate against the whites. Many blacks who lived in Tulsa left and never came back again. 1906, this man was burned alive in Waco, Texas. And these, these, these were, were, were things that were witnessed by thousands of people. Big crowds would come to witness these lynchings. They would bring everybody, bring the children, the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren, the grandmother, the great-grandmother, the whole family would be there. And these things happened openly and typically after a person was lynched, in many cases, they weren't even accused of a, of a real crime. They had committed social crime. Now, typically, we're led to believe that most of these men, these black men were lynched because they raped the white woman or accused of raping the white woman. The, the primary charge that was levied against them was murder. In about 48, 49% of the cases, they were accused of murder, murdering a white person. Only about maybe 20% of the cases were they accused of accosting a white woman. In many of those instances, it was proven later, they were having a relationship with that woman. And she could not suffer the indignity of having white people know she was having a relationship with a black man, so she had to say he raped her. Even though it may have been a man that she was in love with. This man was accused of murdering a white woman. He was burned alive. Newspapers announced lynchings ahead of time. 3,000 will burn Negro. That's in the New Orleans newspaper. John Hartford will be lynched by Ellisville, Mississippi mob at 5 o'clock this afternoon. So if you didn't know, now you know. People could come in from neighboring towns. They used to rent out trains to go get people to come witness these things. These public spectacles, people would be there selling refreshments. But why? Because everybody wanted to have a good time. This was part of reinforcing white supremacy. Enforcing the fact that blacks have no power because whites can do whatever they want to do to them and there's nothing you can do about it. It wasn't a clan, you know, all the clan. This was everybody in town, everybody. Clan member or not, it didn't matter whether the, the clan existed or didn't exist. It didn't matter. For that long period of time when the clan disappeared from the 1870s until 1915, there were no clan members. They didn't even exist. People were being lynched by the thousands. Crowds of 10, 15, 20, 25,000 people would be there to witness it. They'd be there selling refreshments. This was the mood of America. This was the mindset of America. This was what people wanted people to understand about America. White people have power, and they can use that power any way they choose. And there's nothing black people can do about it. That was part of the, the mentality of lynching, was maintaining supremacy. 1954, Brown versus Board of Education desegregated schools. A year later, this young boy, Emmett Till, was murdered in Money, Mississippi about 20 miles from my hometown in Mississippi. He was from Chicago. He moved down to, to Mississippi over the summer to spend time with his uncle, like a lot of black children would go, what they call down south, to spend the summers, and then come back when school started. He was down there. He didn't know the protocol of how blacks and whites related to one another. He didn't understand it. Even though his cousins told him, you know, there's certain things you can't do, he was kind of hard-headed, and he just, you know, he wanted to do what he wanted to do. So he went into a store with some of his cousins, and we still don't know exactly what happened. There's different versions of what happens. Some people say he flirted with the woman in the store. Some people say he whistled at the woman in the store. Nobody really knows, but it doesn't really matter because the woman got upset. She told her husband. Her husband and, and a couple other men came to Emmett Till's uncle's house in the middle of the night, snatched him out of the house, took him to a, a guy's barn, and they beat him, pistol whipping him and all kinds of other things. Basically, to, to try to get him to say he was sorry for flirting with his wife. He refused to do it. And they shot him in the eye. They tied barbed wire around his neck, tied the other end of the barbed wire to a, 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 a cotton gin fan, threw his body in the Tallahatchie River, hoping this fan would weigh his body down and that nobody would find his body. A couple days later, apparently, the barbed wire came loose and his body floated to the surface. A fisherman saw the body, they came and found it. Two men were tried for the murder of Emmett Till. One of the biggest, you know, spectacles 
in the history of Mississippi. This trial lasted for about a week or so. Emmett Till's mother, named Till, came down. But before the trial, she wanted everybody to see what they had done to her son. They wanted to have an open casket funeral. She said, ah, eh, eh, no way. I want everybody. I want the world to see what they did to my son. I want everybody to know this is what they did to this boy. This is a picture of him in his casket in Chicago. 50,000 people witnessed Emmett Till's body in that casket. This is really the spur of the Civil Rights Movement. Not the Montgomery bus boycott, which came after this. This is what enraged black America to the point where they said, we can't take this anymore. They're killing 14-year-old boys for no reason. We gotta stand up and do something. And shortly thereafter, after these men were let off, found not guilty by an all-white jury, and then they gave an interview to Life Magazine telling exactly what they did. <laughs> they were paid $3,000 each, and they said exactly what they did to this boy because they knew double jeopardy, they couldn't be tried again. They laughed about it, thought it was funny. So that's how we know the details of how he was murdered because they told the world by giving an interview to Life Magazine. Black people were very upset. Shortly thereafter, we had the Montgomery bus boycott, which lasted nearly a year. You guys have probably heard the story of these three civil rights workers who were found in Mississippi. Freedom Summer, 1964, whites from around the country had went down to Mississippi to try to get blacks to register to vote. Three men came up missing one day and their bodies were eventually found after an exhaustive search, but it's not like they tell you. If you guys have seen the movie Mississippi Burning, one of the lionest movies you'll ever see in your life. <laughs> one of the lionest movies you'll ever see in your life. The FBI did not find his body because they had this exhaustive search and this wonderful investigation. They had a Klan member who was on their payroll because they had infiltrated the Klan to try to kill the Klan. And he was there when they buried the body under this earth and dam. He told them, but he said, I gotta get paid. They gave the man $30,000 and he told them where the bodies were. They would have never found them. Mississippi burning, they never showed that man. They never talked about the money he got. That's what really happened. That's how they found the bodies. Yes, sir. Yeah, because I remember, uh, it, was, it was months, months before he even found them. Yeah. In, in the process of reading, looking. I was a kid. But I in the process of looking, they found eight other dead black men yeah, floating in right. rivers and creeks and stuff in Mississippi. Mississippi, so I can tell you all kinds of Mississippi stories. I don't have time, but I can tell you some Mississippi stories. Yes, sir. We've had a lot of stuff here on the Holocaust and the Shoah, the killing of the Jews in Germany. And one of the, I used when I was teaching, I had a picture of these three guys on my wall, and to the two people on right and left are Jewish, and one right, mm -hmm. is a black person from Mississippi. So sometimes the same people are. Uh, Crucified. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the exact same yeah. mindset. Yeah. The exact same mindset. Yeah. Because the, they saw these people as, as people who were invading Mississippi. Yeah. They were Jewish. And he had the nerve, they actually had, he had the nerve to have hair on his face. Yeah. That was unheard of back at that time. You can't have hair on your face, it's un American. <laughs> and so that was one of the things that they actually told him that they were mad at him about was that he had the nerve to have hair on his face. So they killed him because, partially because they were Jewish. Remember I told you the Klan was anti-Catholic, anti-Jewish? They hated Jews, they hated Catholics. They were incredibly insensitive to a variety of different people. They murdered a lot of different people. And so mm -hmm. that's part of the mindset that developed. Yes? Did, you, did they ever study the personalities or the, uh, the type of people that were in the Klan, where they came from? Everybody. <laughs> Everybody. Because I, I think of the Nazis, Nazis Germany, what they did to the The same thing Jews. with the Nazis. The Nazis were everybody in Germany. It wasn't a distinct demographic. It was a little bit of everybody. 
you, you, you get this mindset that, that envelops a group of people where this group mentality develops and you feel, you feel compelled, you feel peer pressure to, to go along because you don't want to stand out from the crowd. Some people are courageous enough not to, but most people aren't. They're also empowered by each other. Exactly. I mean, if you look at the Klan, you go back to the Klan of the 1920s, they actually had three versions of the Klan. They had a version for men, a version for women, and a version for children. You look at the Nazis. They had a group for children only, right? So it's the same mindset, and everybody gets enveloped in this mindset. It becomes a mindset that, that let me go back to when we talked about dehumanizing people. In order to do horrible things to people, the first thing you must do is dehumanize them. The way that the Jews were dehumanized by the Germans, they said that they were devil worshipers. They didn't believe in Jesus. They killed Jesus. That's why we hate them. They dehumanized them. They dehumanized blacks by saying they were a separate species. They dehumanized the Native Americans. They're savages. Think about the terminology we use when we talk about people that we don't like as Americans. We went to Vietnam, what do we call it? The Vietnamese people, gooks. The war in Iraq, what do we call the people over there? Sand niggers, towel heads. We use these terminology to dehumanize them, then it's okay to do bad stuff. Because, well, they're different. We find ways to justify all the horrible stuff we did. This young man, Michael Dom, was murdered in 1980 in Mobile, Alabama. This is the story behind it. A uh, police officer, white police officer was killed several months before this by a black person. Police went and investigated. They arrested a black man for it. They weren't really sure he did it, but they arrested him, tried him. The jury said, well, we're not really sure. They don't have good evidence. It was a hung jury. They couldn't come to a verdict. So they let the man out. The next day, the United Clans of America, the biggest Klan group in the country, the one that was really responsible for a lot of the terrorism during the civil rights movement, their leader got on the podium and said these words. If a black man can get away with killing a white man, then a white man should be able to get away with killing a black man. His son and another guy and one of his friends went out the following day looking for some black person to kill. Michael Donald had just left his home, walked into the store to buy a pack of cigarettes. They pulled up next to him, asked him for directions. He leaned over. They pointed a gun at him, forced him into the car, took him out in the remote area, and beat him unmercifully. He fought back, though, until they finally cracked him over the head with a big branch from a tree. Then they cut his neck this way, this way, this way to make sure he was dead. They brought him back to the black section of town, tied this noose around his neck, and left his body for everybody to see. And they bragged about it. That's how they were captured. Eventually they were tried. One of his killers, Henry Hayes, who was the son of the man that made that statement, he was executed in 1996 by the state of Alabama. He was the first execution for white on black crime since 1913. And we know Alabama had a long history of whites killing blacks. I'm almost there. <laughs> Henry Hayes was also the first KKK member in the nation to be executed for the murder of a black person in the 20th century. So the reason I bring this, this up is, is, is to let us know that this mindset that started many years ago has been passed down from generation to generation. There's a very good book that I read. I actually ran across uh, a dissertation someone wrote, and it talked about whether or not young people have the same racial views as their parents and grandparents. And so this professor gave these journals to young white students, and she asked them to document things that they saw that were racial in nature for several months. They did this for a period of about six months. They turned in the journals to her, and she said when she read those journals, she was horrified by these young white people talking about racial jokes that they heard, racial incidents, all kinds of stuff. She said that they seemed to be even more racist than their parents and grandparents. And some of them even said that they were. Even though we try to tell ourselves we live in a post-racial America, that's another one of the biggest lies they've ever came up with. <laughs> we have a black president, we can't be a racist nation anymore. But well, let, 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 let me ask you this question. And I love to ask this question because people never have the answer for it. <laughs> Barack Obama's mother was a white woman, right? Everybody agree with that? Yeah. Okay. His father was a black man, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. So one pair is white, one is black. We get half of our genes from our mother, half from our father, right? Right. So I mean, okay. So how does he become black? Yeah. <laughs> Why is he black? Why is he first like black president? Huh? People don't like to say mixed. No, I ain't know. It ain't got nothing with people saying mixed. I've heard people say, well, he's he biracial. Just looks the, like a black but he, he looks he, like a black person? Yeah. Really? <laughs> All of us well, look the same? Well, that's what But that's why they created him like that. The reason why he's black is he got black blood in him. One drug. That's not why. No. Why? That's not why. The reason he's black is because America has defined him as black. Let me tell you how it worked. For many years, they had what they call anti-miscegenation laws. Laws which determine whether or not you as a non-white person could marry a white person. Every state had their own definition of who could and could not marry white. You guys heard of the one drop rule? Never existed, it's a lie. Every state defined blackness in a particular way. So let's just say we look at Georgia and Alabama, for example. So here I am in Georgia. Georgia says if one of my grandparents is black, I'm black. Alabama says if one of my great-grandparents is black, I'm black. So imagine me. Here I am in Georgia, and one of my grandparents is black, right? But then I go to Alabama, and none of my grandparents, they're all white. But I got a black great-grandfather, so here I'm black, here I'm not black. Then I'm black, not black. Black, not black. How idiotic is it? <laughs> it's idiotic, the way we define race. It has nothing to do with the color of our skins. If I showed you a picture of my great-grandfather, you would swear up and down he was a white guy. You wouldn't know the difference. Black people have been passing for white for years. Race is not, it's not a, a, it's not a scientific thing. Race is a social construct designed to make sure that we give power to certain groups and take it away from others. That's what race is about. Race is about maintaining, and I, I tell people this all the time, maintaining white supremacy. We like to think of white supremacy as being these crazy dudes with the dunce hats on that call themselves the clans. That's not what white supremacy is. So we have to think about how we got to where we are. This whole history of all of these things that I've shared with you guys are all part and parcel of the way we relate to one another as people. It's very ugly part of our history. We don't like to talk about it. We don't we really hate discussing race because it's so hard and we, we, we get into these arguments and we point fingers, we call people names and all these different things. But we always do this from a state of ignorance. That doesn't mean you're dumb. That means you don't know enough. You don't know enough to really discuss race. And when we have these discussions, I remember back when President Clinton was president, put together this commission to study race. And, and, I, and I sat and listened to these people on C-SPAN and they're debating back. And I'm like, where'd they get these idiots from? <laughs> these people are idiots. They don't even know what they're talking about. They, 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 you have to look into the history of it. Think about this. If you travel from Chicago to Los Angeles, right? Once you got to Los Angeles, and someone said, how'd you get from Chicago? You say, well, I took Interstate 40 and I did that. You'd be able to tell them, right? That's part of your history. How you got there from here is a part of who you are. How we got to where we are in 2013 as a nation goes back to 1619 and before. Goes to 1787 and the Constitution basically justified white supremacy, justified slavery. We started as a country that was racist and sexist. And we're surprised it's still that way now? Really? I mean, think about it. I always use this example. I remember a woman at the museum got mad at me for saying this, but I believe this. I look at our nation like an apple tree. If you got an apple tree in your backyard, you don't go to that tree to get oranges or pears or peaches, do you? You only get apples. Why? Because that's the only fruit that tree can bear. It was born to be an apple tree. So our nation is the same. <laughs> When it started, the roots of our country were related to racism and sexism. It's in the fabric of America. It's not gonna go away because we got a person that we call a black man in, in the White House. It doesn't just go away. It only goes away when it goes away up here in our minds. And when we stop teaching our children this ignorance, when we stop judging people based on these, 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 these things that we think we know about black people or we know about white people or we know about Jewish people or Asian people. I mean, I hear people say stuff and it's like, are you kidding me? Do you think everybody fits in these neat little categories because they're black? Or that everybody fits in this neat little category because they're Catholic? Or everybody fits in these, I mean, we assume all these things and I always tell people, 
It's okay to send these a black guy. Call me black. I'm proud to be black. Call me a black man. Don't say, I don't see color. You're lying. <laughs> you are a liar. If you tell me you don't see color, you're either blind or you're a liar. And I ain't seen too many blind people say that they don't see color. I see plenty of people that can see, I don't see color. Yes, you do. Just don't let that color develop a consciousness in your mind that says this person has to fit into this category, this stereotype. Don't see me as a stereotypical black guy. When you're walking down the street, don't think you got to grab your purse because I'm walking past you. I had a woman do this to me several years ago. I love to tell a story. I'm sitting in the light. I had a really nice car at the time. I'm sitting at the light and I'm waiting for the light to change. There's a white woman in the car next to me. I mean, she got an old raggedy beater. I'm sitting in my car and I look over at her. You, know, you, you sit in the light, you wait for the light to change. You kind of look around, right? So I look over and she's looking at me and then she locks her car doors. <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, you think I'm going to get out of this nice car and take that beater and drive away? Are you crazy? I mean, I was really upset. But that's the mindset that is developed in Americans. We are crazy people because we make these assumptions about people and we think it's real. We think that race is real. And we define race in such a way that we make it real when it isn't. That's what Dr. Cameron wanted us to fight against. He wanted us to develop this mindset where we're all one single sacred nationality. We're all the same. We're part of the one race that exists on the planet, which is the human race. Regardless of these, these the definitions we give, you know, uh, Hispanics or, or black or Asian or whatever, it's all just, it's on the surface. It's about what's inside that matters. Yes? Don't you think that after knowing, you know, the 20th century about genocide and everything, that majority of the people in America really are good people and don't want that, that, the, that it's gotten around to the point, don't you think? I, I, would, I would hope that it's that way, but I see evidence to the contrary right. every day. I think we're I very see evidence. We are a racist society, and I, I recommend everybody here to read the book by Michelle Alexander called The New Jim Crow. Yeah. yeah. It is, it is, I would pay people. I think, how many people are here? I would pay ten dollars if you go check out this book and I'll... I, I mean, it, it, you've got to, it, because it's con story it's continues. It's really. Not we are still racist. racist. Yes, sir. Who was the first, <laughs> if you know, in 1913 that was... Uh, I guess prosecuted and executed. I've never been able to find out who's, who, what that person's name was. I'm not sure. I've been looking, but I can't find it. Uh, the, 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 this information comes from a group called the Southern Poverty Law Center. Michael Donald's mother was contracted, contacted by a man by the name of Morris Dees who runs the Southern Poverty Law Center. They sued the United Clans of America for murdering her son in civil court. She actually won the case. She won everything that the Klan had, which was a must. They owned a little piece of land, they owned an office building. All of that was given to her. She put the United Clans of America permanently out of business by suing them. So that was a huge victory for her. But she didn't get much out of it. But she said, you know what, I, really, I wasn't doing this for the money anyway, but I'm glad that I could take away something that they had since they took away my son. Yes, sir? There's a great book called Rough Crossing, by a really well-known, excellent historian who says that the United States Revolution was not fought for freedom, it was fought to maintain slavery. And that, and you have to read the whole book, and mm -hmm. it's true. Yeah. So, um, I mean, if you look at the first draft of the Declaration of Independence that Thomas Jefferson wrote, of one of the things that he said that was yeah. taken out of the, the, the version we've read yeah. is he blamed King George of England for mistreating Africans. Yeah. How horribly he's treating these people yeah. for no apparent reason. Y'all doing the same thing! <laughs> so of course, they said, man, you gotta take that part out. And they, he took it out. Another great thing in that book is that it has a really dense history of all the black people who fought against slavery and gave their lives to have slavery end and to get away from slavery, including thousands and thousands that went on the side of the British and by that time it become so knowledgeable that they were actually the pilots for the British ships that were attacking the, uh, 
Absolutely. colleges. That Absolutely. And there, there were a group it's, of blacks. It's just an incredibly good book full of stuff that I've never seen anywhere else. Let me talk to you after we're done. I'll yeah. get the title of the book. That sounds very interesting. Okay. But that, that's an interesting story because there were lots of blacks who fought for the side of the British in the Revolutionary War because they were promised their freedom. Yeah. Well, uh, ended up, they, they kind of got screwed in jail. Yeah. But in the Civil War, over 300,000 blacks actually served in the, in the, yeah. the, the Union Army and Navy and really helped turn the tide of that war. The last thing I want to show you guys is this quote from Abraham Lincoln. Remember I talked to you about white supremacy and how it was inbred in the, in the mindset of America. Abraham Lincoln, what you call the great emancipator, he freed the slaves. This is what he said about black people. He hated slavery as an institution. He thought it was tearing the country apart, but he didn't like black people. How many of you guys have heard of his plan to send blacks to colonies outside of the U.S. That was his plan. He said, okay, we're gonna free them, we gotta get them out of the country. He had plans to send them to either Brazil or someplace in the Caribbean because it was cheaper than trying to send them back to Africa. He actually sent a minister down to Panama to look at some land to see if he could send the blacks there. So I always tell people, Abraham Lincoln had views on slavery and he had views on slaves. They were not the same. Just because he hated slavery didn't mean he was a friend of the slaves. He felt that these black people were inferior to whites. And, and, and to me, the most important part, there must be the position of superior and inferior and uh, I, as much as any other man, am in favor of having a superior position assigned to the white race. If somebody came on TV, let's just say somebody went on CNN tomorrow, and they said these words, first thing somebody said, how did they let that white supremacist on CNN? <laughs> That's what people would say, right? But Abraham Lincoln said this. It's not like it was a secret that he said this. How come people didn't hear about this in their history classes? How come nobody ever told you this in your history classes? His views about blacks, that he didn't really care for blacks. That he used to be famous for telling nigger jokes. And I hate that word. I only use it in terms of when I'm talking about it, because I hate the word, but he was famous for telling great nigger jokes. Everybody that knew him said, man, Abraham Lincoln just saw some great nigger jokes. That's what he was famous for amongst his friends. He didn't like black people. He said there's a physical difference between the black and white races, which I believe will forever forbid the two races living together on terms of social and political equality. I think he was right. How I can think you he say was right. that? We have a lot I of I think he was races. right about the races not being able to live on terms of social and political equality, because we're still fighting for that social and political so equality forever. today. Yeah. So thank you all for coming. Thank you so much. I probably went over the time. I apologize. But I've enjoyed you guys. I have some great questions. And please do, do me this favor. If you get an opportunity, our museum closed in 2008. We're now a virtual museum. If you go to abhmuseum.org, that's the museum's website. Tons of great information there. Lots of information about Dr. Cameron. Lots of information about the history of lynching, civil rights movement. There's tons and tons of information. We have a section we call Breaking News, which keeps you updated on different things happening around the country, around the world. It's a great resource for anybody to study any of these things we talked about. Please go there. If you read an article, please leave us a comment. Give us some feedback. We really appreciate it. We've been visited by over 160 nations so far since we launched the website a little over a year ago. And we really, really want everybody to partake in the information. Well, where? Where we go? Online. ABHmuseum.org. Any, any chance?